Hi, I am Jackie Miller, high conflict divorce coach and consultant and host of this podcast, Out of Crazy Town, your guide to divorcing a narcissist. Today, I have Tracy Malone joining me to talk about her new book, Divorcing Your Narcissist, You Can't Make This Shit Up. Tracy is an internationally recognized expert on emotional abuse and narcissistic personality disorder and is also a survivor, a term she has trademarked to describe those that are learning to thrive after suffering narcissistic abuse. Tracy is the founder of NarcissistAbuseSupport.com, a global resource dedicated to empowering those dealing with narcissistic abuse. Hello, Tracy Malone. Welcome back to Out of Crazy Town, your guide to divorcing a narcissist. Thank you so much for having me. It's so much fun to see you all the time. (laughs) Thank you. It's so fun to see you too. And I said welcome back because if listeners uh, have not heard previous episodes, you joined me before and it was a two-part show. Uh, And you were generous to come on and really go through your story, your journey, and how you got to where you are today. And I just love that you came on and did that. And we referenced in that show or those shows that you were working on a book at the time. Yes, that would be a while ago. Yes, but it's here. (laughs) Books take a while, especially good ones like this one. So it's here and I'm excited because this is clearly extremely appropriate being on a podcast on your guide to divorcing a narcissist when your book is called divorcing your narcissist you can't make this shit up (laughs) everybody says it it's like (laughs) of course that's what we think yes 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 so and you are overqualified really to be writing this book and and doing all the work you do be and you are an internationally recognized expert on emotional abuse and narcissistic personality disorder and founder of NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. And you get to add author now to all of those accolades. So No, it's so cool. In fact, you know what? Everybody keeps telling me that your book is your best business card. And so you know what I did? I got a license plate that says author one for my car. And I'm like, no, that's my biggest advertiser. (laughs) I love it. I'm an author. See my car? (laughs) Absolutely. Well-deserved. Well, you know, I was listening to um, a different podcast this morning on just sort of personal growth. And they had mentioned to anyone out there that has a story that could help others to don't keep it to yourself. It's almost selfish. There is someone in the world that needs to hear your story. And I think even in this sort of subculture of narcissist abuse survivors, Um, we see patterns of abuse, but each story is still so individual. And so it's always so welcome when anyone comes out and offers help and tells their story like you have. So thank you. Um, It helps people not think that they're alone. Yeah. And you, you know, you have coined the term Sir Thriver or actually trademarked it to be more specific. Mm -hmm. And it's even listed or mentioned again in one of the subtitles of the book, the covert tricks they pull and the strategies to become a Sir Thriver. Would you talk a little bit about Sir Thriver and and what it means to you and why you trademarked it? So I, I kind of coined it. I coined it back in 2017 as almost the last stage of recovery. So it was, you know, you're a deer in the headlight, you're the victim, and then you make your way up gradually till you become a survivor. And um, a survivor to me is someone like you who gives back. They take their lessons and they give back. They, even if it's like the man at Starbucks, the woman like doing your feet, getting a manicure. Someone told me yesterday, I was like, I was at my manicures and this lady, two people away, was talking about it and she educated her and she helped her. We, we give back. We go from hopeless to hopeful in the middle and then to having like hope and and future just all kinds of lifting up inspiration that makes you not hold on to the victim story but use the victim story to help others just as as the word implies you go from just surviving to now you're thriving and hope is such a big part of that I completely agree yeah I mean it's it's if you look at just having no hope in the beginning no understanding 
thinking, how will I get out? How will I survive to make it through to the other side and then go, you know what? I'm going to give back. Absolutely. Well, I found your book to be the perfect combination of the sort of nuts and bolts of divorcing a narcissist, sort of things you need to know in the process. And then you also do such a great job of educating readers on, for instance, all the different kinds of narcissism. Um, And it's really important to understand because, like I said earlier, we can see patterns of behavior that, that line up, but there are still so many subtle differences that can happen that make my story maybe a little different than yours, but it is very validating and empowering to understand all the different um, kinds. Was that difficult to really write and get into all those different? You know, I, I hear it from my clients on a daily basis. Uh, so it's sort of like, well, let's not forget that one. Oh, they could also do this. And and I think what blocks victims of this type of abuse is the stereotypes, you know, that the narcissist is full of themselves and we grandiosely be able to see who they are. Like, of course, that's one way we can see that type, right? It's they're wearing it on their sleeve. It's the covert ones. It's the ones that nobody suspects that leaves the victim going, well, he he doesn't hit me or she doesn't do this, right? They're sitting there with that wall and I'm going, no, it's all of these situations, right? It's more than just your overt, covert and malignant. It, 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 it borderlines in between, you know, you can get really into like a sociopath kind of mentality when you dig down and understand the nuts and bolts of how that person's put together. But that sort of invisible abuse that people are like, well, it wasn't so bad. He didn't hit me. He almost hit me, but he didn't hit me. So it must not be abuse. I wanted them to see this is how it presents. I did a lot of talking about the masks that they wear. Mm. Because, oh, but he was the best soccer player. He's a great dad. Okay, well, in front of people, maybe. How was he behind doors? Oops. Yeah, ding, right? So I really tried to outline all that. Absolutely. And you did such a good job because it is part of that element that does make you feel like you're going crazy because you have this outside world that's seeing their mask to mm-hmm. your point. And what you're experiencing in the home is so drastically different and it can literally drive you mad. And it's also sort of the death by a thousand paper cuts, because if you try to relay, say, one or two incidences by themselves to a friend or family member or you kind of sound crazy for making it sound like such a big deal because no one truly understands the world that you're living in. Absolutely. I even added, I don't know if you remember it, but I put in two different kinds of narcissists into that bucket when I described them. Um, And and one in particular is making a big stir. I have the rich and the poor narcissist because in divorce, it matters. Um, A rich narcissist is going to be more likely to drag you over the coals, to defend their money, to make sure you get nothing. Um, They're out for blood. It's entitlement in its grandest form because they've got the money and they're going to try to keep it and keep it away. So it's a different battle in divorce. A poor narcissist um, or someone without assets and money are going to go after your money with all that same vigor, right? And you have to understand there's a difference you know it's not a normal divorce as you and I both know but when you're dealing with a rich one or a poor one the tactics that they use are so terrible and you know you just wonder how could I have not seen this yeah absolutely that's very interesting that you say that because it really feeds into when you are in a divorce with someone with a personality disorder like this, it's so important to sort of profile them Mm -hmm. and understand, even though you've been maybe living or married to this person for a very long time, until you sit down and look at those personality traits in this context, and then try to predict what might happen down the road with them, how you might handle it. It's a very useful tool. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Again, profiling, you know, if you've got a lawyer as an ex, they're going to litigate. If you've got, you know, a doctor, I mean, they just have specific ways they operate and, you know, they can take it down into that. Again, what do they do if they're a salesman? They're going to sales everybody in their path and convince and sell the story, the fake story, right? So knowing what they do and how they operate, and it's almost a skill. I mean, knowing that their skill is to be the salesperson, then we're going to have to combat that, right? We understand that. So 
again, profiling, absolutely essential because it gives you like a leg up to understand who the com who the, the the opponent is, if you would, not just the person you slept next to, but what are they capable of because of this career or these traits? Absolutely. I also love that it, going back to the perfect mix of everything that your book is, it's all of that wrapped up and then you have a major emotional support sort of element to it. And so you get this logistical, you get this educational, you get this emotional support. Did you have a favorite sort of part of the book when you wrote it? I don't know if there was a favorite because writing it for two and a half years, I wrote it 72,000 times. So it was like, <laughs> that's my favorite this week and next week, <laughs> you know, there was sure. so much in there. Um, but, you know, triggers are, are my, my, funnest, I know it sounds like a really geeky thing, but understanding your triggers is the secret to getting through the divorce because the narcissist knows exactly what your triggers are. And they are there to push your buttons, knock you off balance so that you are not a good opponent to them. You you lose your power, it, it benefits them. So understanding the root of your triggers is such an important part of this. You do. You talk about that. I remember and you call them, you know, you get to turn your triggers into a superpower. Mm -hmm. And I found that fascinating um, because you're right. It, it's we're so busy being triggered. <laughs> we don't think about them actually as a tool you could use. I mean, like, how else do you see that playing out in the divorce as a, as a superpower? I mean, it, it's it's just to know that to know them, to not let them bother you. Like if if you do not have control of your triggers, they will control your divorce. If they know exactly how to get you over and over and over, you're just going to keep going down, down, down. If, if you learn to control your triggers, you have the superpower to go, yeah, right, good try. I know what you're doing and not absorb that negative energy or that emotional sting by, you know, and then you do have the superpower. Then you are more in control than you know, just getting blindsided, 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 and just going, oh, and, and you get into a, such a hypervigilant, you know, PTSD kind of coping strategy that you're not effective to defend yourself or to pull together the things that you need in the divorce. You have to be on your top game. So if they're going to keep knocking you down, you have to learn to deflect that and not absorb it. Yeah. And, you know, talking about profiling and then um, going into this topic with the triggers, it's kind of like they've profiled you and they did it a long time ago. They did it when they first met you. I, and I've never really thought about it in this context before, but you were profiled right off the bat so that they could manipulate you. Right. I mean, it's all about from the very first time you met them. Let's see if she has boundaries. Let's see if he does this. Is he willing to go here? How can he, you know, they are playing us to understand what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, what our vulnerabilities are. And even to the fact of, you know, what kind of family you come from, because it's going to be rubbed in your face that you don't even have a good family or, you know, you think your family's so smart, you know, it's just going to get used against you no matter which direction it is, but they find the weakness and they find it so that they can exploit it in this situation. Yeah. And I was having a conversation about triggers recently with the group also, and the surprise element, or we allow ourselves, I guess, to continually be surprised, um, for lack of a better word, it like, oh my, I, I can't believe they did this now. Or you, you get that next email from their attorney, who's really just an extension of them, right? Or, and how to turn that into, let's expect it. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's, instead of being surprised by it, let's expect it. And we were even brainstorming, what do you think your NARC's next surprise is going to be? So it's not a surprise. Let's expect it there. Um, you know, I heard a really funny analogy. It was like, does the sun rise in the East? Do dogs bark? Do they're narcissists? It's what they do. They will do it again. Let's, what is their, what is where, how are they trying to get to you? Mm -hmm let's expect it rather than be surprised by it. Absolutely. And that that's what, I, I don't know if you remember the chapter, but I have a chapter called my dumbass theory. <laughs> I, I wanted you to explain this. Yes, please go. It was actually coined because after my husband left and I'm like packing up a giant house and we had this big bulletin board of pictures and memorabilia. And there was this little postcard that said dumbass on it. And it had this little cartoon guy. And I, um, I was like, right there. Oh. 
I'm like, you know, I pick that thing up and I'm like, well, it's kind of like figures it out that it's him. But if we think about any story that we have, like with a friend that is always late or always blows you off at the last minute, you know, they're still your friend, but you absolutely know that reliability wise, they're not going to be there when they say they are, or they're going to cancel three times before you actually see them. We just know that about certain friends. We expect it. If they were terrible things, they wouldn't be their friend. But if we get to the point where we realize that's just them, we accept about them, why are we letting it bother us? Of course, they're going to cancel plans three times. That's what they do. A narcissist is going to lie. They're going to like project. They're going to false allegations you. Of course, it's a defense. And so learning to let it go as opposed to letting it stick to you. Like we can be Velcro and let all of their things that they're doing attach to us. Or we can learn, yeah, of course they're doing that. What else you got? Go ahead. You know, instead of like, because that's what they want. When they pull these tactics, they are designed to elevate you emotionally and put you in a place where you can't defend yourself or that you get so emotional that you're not thinking straight. So learning that it was just what they're going to do instead of the, oh God, they did it again. Why would they do it again? Guess what? It worked. That's why they're doing it again. You know, when the fact is when it stops working, the game's over. It's like, okay, now we're going to have to come up. That worked for a long time. She's not reacting to it. Oh, well, you know, you're taking back your power because all they want, as you know, supply is a reaction. Supply is a reaction. So if you don't give them one and go, you know, whatever, talk to the hand, go home, punch the bed, punch the pillow, like get it out, but don't let them see that it got to you. And our bodies were not designed to be in surprise mode all of the time or or frequently. And so, yes, it, there is a physical reaction you have, and it does take you down not only emotionally, but physically. I mean, when you're in surprise mode, your brain stops working, you know, at that high capacity because you're supposed to either be keeping yourself safe from whatever the threat is, or even if it's a happy surprise, surprise party, woo, adrenaline's up, comes back down a few minutes mm-hmm. later. You know, but it's, we're not designed to be in that state all the time. And so you really need mechanisms and coping strategies like you suggest in your book to, you know, to get yourself out of that mode. It's all about changing what you can change to get through it because we can't change them. Again, we're expecting them to A, B, and C. Oh, it's B time again. Okay, he's trying this again. Oh, I'm a bad mother today. Oh, I stole money today. Expect it and know your truth. That's the key. Like if they're accusing you of being a bad parent, instead of going, I'm not a bad parent. They should know that I'm a good parent. I'm the only one that took care of the kids, you know, instead going, I already know I'm the better parent. And I've got all the evidence, the teachers, the doctors, the people that will testify that I'm the caregiver of the children, right? Instead of reacting, why? But they know that I'm not a bad parent. Right. Of course they do, but they don't care. The strategy for them to win is to prove that you're a bad parent. Duh. Thanks. But it's not going to work. Right. Instead of letting that emotional and we all have it. I mean, I defended myself. I was a thief. I forged papers. I did this. I'm like, what? And I was like ready to prove to the world a hundred thousand dollars worth that I didn't do any of the things they claimed. Never once thinking, don't they have to prove that I stole money? Because I'm the one who gave 5,000 pieces of financial paper and they gave none. Are they getting this idea that I stole money, right? I never thought. I always went into defense mode um, and it cost me a lot more money. Yeah. And and we hear that a lot, right? With clients that talk about always being on the defense and how crappy, frankly, it feels um, Mm -hmm. to be in that mode in your case. And there is nothing better than when you feel like you've got a little bit of offense going. Um, Mm -hmm. But a lot of it just lies with mindset. Mm -hmm. It really does because that's all we can control. And the stuff's going to fly, right? It's, It's a ping pong game. It's going to go back and forth, but- knowing what to defend and knowing what to slide off is going to be your sanity. Absolutely. And now you also have a journal available that you can get, right? That goes with your book. How do you suggest people use a journal when they're going through the divorce or, or your journal in particular, even? Um, well, basically on the, that's just documenting your, your, um, abuse or, or in this particular case, your divorce. So you have conversations with your coaches, you have conversations with your therapists, with your lawyers, like your, 
you know, documenting things that they might be doing. So they came home or the kids came home and they said, daddy said this, mommy said that, you know, putting it all there. This is sort of on the fly. If it is something that you're documenting, like they didn't show up for parenting time and that sort of thing, put it in the journal because you're sitting in the Burger King parking lot waiting for them, put it in, go, this is what happened. I sent a text, I documented it. Now go and put that in your real spreadsheet that will go to the, to the lawyer. We don't carry around a spreadsheet to sit there and put it in when you're sitting there at a pickup site, right? But documenting all of those details. And while 75% of it may not be used, if they need it and you don't have it, then it's not worth anything, right? So over-documenting is not a bad thing. It's a pain in the neck. But if you are building a case, building a case means putting all the evidence together to protect yourself. Yeah, and it's so true because even as we talked about earlier, with one little story or two little stories on their own don't sound like a big deal to the outside world, you are trying to explain the narrative. And so often it does take a lot of documentation, even of little things, because when you fill in the gaps of those little things between the big things, everyone goes, oh, wow. Then, then we're showing patterns, right? Right. That's what our goal here is if they don't pick up the kid like or three times a month, five times a month that they're denying their parenting time. Now you've got a history and that documentation paper trail that maybe might help define less parenting time or another solution. Again, you don't know what you have till you have it all together. And your lawyer goes, well, there's 17 times in the last month they've denied their parenting time. We can use that. Right. And so, again, one or two here and there, you're like, oh, it's only one or two. And then next month, there's two or three more. By the time your divorce is over and you have a big number, if that's where you're going, Going with your defense, then you have the evidence and the dates and things like that. Right. And I think that it's important for people to remember that because this is such a chip away mentality marathon situation in a lot of these divorces. And so finding the emotional support, having the strategies and knowing that documenting these little things could add up one day could be worth it. It's helping build the narrative. You know, when you know there's a reason for what you're doing, it becomes a little bit more tolerable or a little more, you have a little more incentive to carry through with it. And, and it's your future. Again, you may not be in this high of a conflict situation, but you never know when it's going to turn, right? You never know if it is someone that you believe has NPD, the accusations are going to fly. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, so yeah. learning and documenting it and keeping it all in one little pretty book is, is a much better way than going, oh, I better write that down when I come home or there's 400 little post-its on your table. And then you go, what did this mean? You're in the parking lot. They didn't show up. I sent three texts, no emails, no response. Okay, let's go somewhere else, honey. And you take the kids off to somewhere else, right? So having it there and documenting it on the spot is going to help you a lot. Awesome. That's a great tool. Um, you did something in your book that I've really never seen before. And I was wondering if you would read to us, you sent a message to your abusers. And uh, I was wondering if you would mind reading that to us. Sure. So in my dedication, it's quite long. I gave lots of them to all the people that guided me on this journey. Um, but this part is the last part and it's to my abusers. When you took advantage of my kind heart, you thought you could break me because I was weak for having emotions. I dedicate this book to you. Had you not been so evil and heartless, I would have never hit bottom and discovered the deep wounds that I needed to heal. Because of your abuse, I will never be the same, and that has changed my life for the better. I never want to be the girl who accepts gaslighting, abuse, or anything less than I deserve. Sorry to disappoint you, but the poison didn't work. I am thriving despite your attempts to ruin me. That is so powerful because there is a point when you get through and you're starting to get through this process and you have to realize, you don't have to, but you should try to realize the skills you've built, the things that you've been through that have made you stronger. And it's true, Tracy. I mean, I'm sitting here today doing this podcast because of what I went through. And I thoroughly am thrilled that I'm out there hopefully helping people. And I wouldn't be doing it if I had not gone through what I'd gone through. And it's another level of healing to go. Thank you. 
-hmm. My life took this path where I get to give back and help others. And also heal myself, you know, and in some ways I was like, I take accountability. I did not know I was raised by a narcissist, had no boundaries, was a people pleaser and all of the things that made me vulnerable. I had to heal all that stuff. So because of them, I would have just kept on going in my little life, completely blind to my own accountability. And so, yeah, I had to learn some stuff. I had to heal a lot of deep, you know, childhood wounds and thank you. I mean, I've never been happier. So that is the key. And, and, you know, there were plenty of them in that paragraph. I don't name names, but there's plenty that, that really shaped that about me. And even those like my father, who's one of his last things he said to me was you're writing a book. You never even wrote a term paper. Who the hell is going to read that? Well, hello, (laughs) you know, I just had to go that kind of negative stuff in my head stopped me from stepping into what I should have been a long time ago. So yeah, had you not been so cruel too, I I would have kept on thinking I never could do this. So absolutely. Well, I applaud you. I think it's fantastic. It's an amazing book. I really encourage everyone to go out and find it. In fact, would you tell everyone how they can find it? Sure, they can get it on Amazon and Kindle and Barnes and Noble and uh, Audible. Rejected my Audible last week for two reasons. Number one, the word shit in the title. Had to make a new cover. Okay, but you have it on the book. Okay, whatever. Um, And the second reason was the narrator that I hired that took seven months to read the 13 and a half hours of it. They said, you our requirements are that you have a human to read it. Please find a human and submit it again. I'm like, so the last seven months of her reading it and me correcting things, I'm like, would you like those? Because I could show you those too. She's human, I swear. So hopefully it's been resubmitted. Hopefully this week it will get accepted. Um, but um, That would be awesome. I just keep saying to my friends, I'm like, yep, you can't make that shit up again. <laughs> like, really? The, the Audible person's written and read books on Audible before. She's like, I never heard of that. I'm like, it's like the voodoo doll of, of you can't make this shit up. Well, and just more journeys for us to march on and learn from our our mistakes. But, you know, and it's so cool um, because you are an inspiration, you know, to the rest of us out there. You know, we all pick our different platforms maybe to tell our story, but but, um, this is really such a great resource. So again, you guys, Divorcing Your Narcissist, you can't make this shit up on Amazon. It's on Kindle. And you can also go to NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. Is that right, Tracy? Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, great. And um, lastly, JackieMillerCoaching.com or OutOfCrazyTown.com. It is on my recommended reading list as well. So you can go to the page on my website and find it. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Well, thank you again for joining me, Tracy. I uh, always love having you on. You're a wealth of information and um, just another tool out there to help to help people get through their battle. Thank you for all that you do for this community. We, it takes a lot of warriors and a lot of survivors to help others out of the hole. It sure does. Okay, take care. And I look forward to talking to you soon.